Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Novak, um, and I'm here today to explain uh, this thing that I've been working on called the Graph Positional Burroughs Wheeler Transform, uh, and to sort of zoom in on one of the applications of this graph genome technology that Eric was just talking about. Uh, so just to recap, uh, in case you weren't paying attention during the last presentation, uh, the basic idea is that we have this uh, graph representation of a genomic reference. So instead of just having one linear sequence, you can branch out into multiple nodes and then come back together. Uh, we have sort of definitions for, for things. We have the nodes, they're connected at different sides by these different edges, and that, that forms this uh, genome graph. Uh, we're at UC Santa Cruz particularly interested in applying this genome graph technology uh, for the purpose of creating what we call the human genome variation map, uh, which is supposed to be a next generation genomic reference uh, that includes variation from all human populations um, and especially helps us represent complex genomic variation, uh, which isn't all that easily represented in the current linear reference context. Uh, a graph will allow you to do things like translocations and inversions just by wiring them up. Uh, and in this context, one of the things we're particularly interested in is the storage of haplotypes. Um, so the way that we're thinking is sort of easiest to do this is by storing uh, people's genomes as threads in this graph, basically sequences of visits to different nodes. Uh, so one person's genome might take this red path through these nodes at the top. One person might take this green path through the nodes at the bottom. You could even have both these haplotypes in one individual. Uh, but we want to represent this data. Uh, the problem with using this sort of thread model as our basic representation for uh, haplotypes is that it can get a little bit unwieldy when we want to scale to large numbers of samples. Uh, for example, we're going to need two threads for every sample for every chromosome in order to really spell this out, uh, which comes out to 115,000 threads in the 1,000 genomes data set alone. Uh, and since each thread has to visit each node along the chromosome, when we do this with the node sizes that we've been using uh, in our graphs, we get on the order of 1.3 million nodes for every single thread, and that's something like 150 billion total visits uh, of threads to nodes, which uh, if you were paying attention during the uh, one of the previous talks, I think it was the PubChem talk, uh, that's where storing this stuff just as flat RDF triple stores can start to pose a bit of a problem. So we're looking for alternative ways to store this. Uh, and one of the things that came up in our research uh, is this idea of the positional burroughs wheeler transform uh, from Richard Durbin. Uh, and basically, it's a way to store a lot of haplotypes in not a lot of space. Uh, so the way you do this is you represent every haplotype as a sequence of bits, either 0 or 1, for ref allele or alt allele, uh, arrayed along sort of a linear sequence of sites. And at every site, you take your collection of haplotypes, which you're keeping as a big list, and you reorder them by what value they had at the previous site. The zeros go first, and then the ones. Uh, so that's a little confusing. So I'm going to show you a cool little demo here. So here are our three haplotypes. Uh, red, blue, and green, and we have a few different sites in our example genome here. Uh, so you start with them in any order, and you just put down, all right, red has the T, blue has the A, and then green has the T, right? Uh, so then first you put the zeros in the next site in the ordering, then you put all the ones, and you'll notice this is a stable sort. <coughs> so since red came first before, red is still first now. Uh, then you fill in the values for that site. Then you reorder again, take the zeros, put them first, then the ones, then you fill that in, and then you continue uh, across the whole genome, or at least the whole chromosome. 
And this generates the positional Burroughs Wheeler transform. And this is pretty compressible because at every site you're going to have the haplotypes ordered sort of by the prefix leading up to that site, uh, but the reverse prefix. So the, the upshot of this is that similar haplotypes are going to be grouped together, which means that they're likely to have the same value at the site that you're looking at right now, which means you can run length, compress it, or use some other sort of efficient compression algorithm, and it makes the whole data set more compressible and allows you to fit it in a smaller amount of space. So we generalize this to graphs to create the graph positional Burroughs Wheeler transform. Uh, the way that that works is first, instead of sorting the uh, visits of haplotypes to sites by their values at the previous site, you actually group them by node in the graph that they visit. So in the graph, the A and the T here, where's my cursor here? Yeah, the A and the T are different nodes. Yeah, go back. So everybody who visits the A can go on the A node, and everyone who visits the T can go on the T node. Um, and then within that, you're still sorting stably by where you were before. See? So over here, the blue is before the green because the blue was previously up here and, and you don't cross over unnecessarily. But then, since we're recording the value that you have at a site by sort of where you go, we no longer need to record on every node the value of the site or on every haplotype visit the value that it has. So instead, what we do is we record information about what node you visit next. Uh, which is expressed in terms of which of the edges leaving each node you take. So here in our little genome graph, the A node can connect either to this C uh, or to this double C node, and the T node can also connect to the C or the double C. This is sort of a complete genome graph here. From any node, you can go to any of the available next nodes. And you'll notice the edges are numbered. There's edge number one leaving the A and edge number two leaving the A. <coughs> So here the blue haplotype should say number two, sorry, it leaves by edge number two. And then here it leaves by edge number two again, and then it leaves by edge number two again, and you get to the end. So that's what we're actually storing on the nodes. And this, because we sort of retain the essential sorting properties of the normal positional Burroughs Wheeler transform, uh, this is also compressible. You're likely to see situations like here on the C node where there's two of the same value in a row, or two or more, and you can compress those very efficiently. Uh, yeah, so this is just rehashing what I, what I just told you. In the graph positional Burroughs Wheeler transform, uh, we store the visits to the nodes on the nodes. Uh, within each node, the visits are ordered by the order of the edge that they came from coming into the node. And then each uh, visit on the node tells you which edge you take leaving the node. And they sort of stack up. As you read down here, you, you place them on the outgoing edge, and, and they stack up, and they form these sorts of bands that run through the whole structure. That, that gets you the compressibility. Um, so here's an example of how compressible this is. Uh, we built a genome graph for the 1,000 genomes VCF for chromosome 22, uh, which covered about 50 million bases. And we then put all 5,008 uh, 1,000 genomes haplotypes for chromosome 22 uh, into a GB, GPBWT uh, index that we implemented in Eric's VG tool. Uh, you can see the whole thing came out to about 573 megabytes uh, for the GPBWT data, uh, which is less than 0.02 bits per uh, base of haplotype sequence. And here's our cool plot. This is the space taken up 
by the GPVWT data, and then this is the space taken up by the rest of the graph. So it sort of dominates the index size here. Uh, but one of the cool things you get from this is that you can efficiently look up subhaplotypes. You can follow a path in the graph and say how many haplotypes in the index also follow this path. Uh, and so we did that. We counted up for uh, primary and secondary read alignments to this uh, graph, how many haplotypes were consistent with them. Uh, and we found that secondary reads tend more often not to be consistent with any haplotypes than the primary reads do. Only 1% of primary alignments were uh, inconsistent with all the haplotypes in the index versus 2.5% of secondary read alignments. Uh, and we also simulated random walks, and way more of those were inconsistent with uh, the haplotypes in the index. So we're thinking that this can potentially be applied to try and distinguish what reads are really mapped well versus what reads are mapped badly based on whether they agree with known haplotypes. Uh, but we're still trying to work out exactly how to implement that. And so that's why it's on our list of open questions. How do we use haplotype path queries in alignment to figure out which alignments are good and which alignments are bad? Uh, we're also interested in uh, good ways to build this GPBWT data structure when our graphs are cyclic. Uh, we have an algorithm for building it for cyclic graphs that basically amounts to inserting each haplotype one at a time. And in theory, the, uh, the time complexity of this isn't that bad. But in practice, we're dealing with uh, current implementations of succinct data structures and moreover dynamic succinct data structures to build this on, uh, which is kind of a small and fiddly field. And in practice that algorithm doesn't seem to work all that well. So in our, in our testing we've used an algorithm that only works for DAGs but it's much more efficient. So we're hoping maybe someone at the hackathon would like to uh, implement this in a more efficient way for cyclic graphs. And we're also interested in thinking about how to attach this back to RDF and other sorts of linked data representations uh, because this is sort of an index that represents in some sense a giant 150 billion tuple, tuple store. We just can't articulate it like that because it would be too huge. Uh, so we could put up a sparkle endpoint on top of this, but then what if we run into that problem that was mentioned where you can run a Sparkle query and it might take a week. We don't know. So we're interested in what we can really do with this to maybe make it available in a way through RDF that it would be efficient to access. That's potentially a, a place where hackathon projects can be, can be produced. Um, and in conclusion, I'd like to thank uh, the hackathon organizers. Uh, also, uh, Glenn and Sean and Magic, everyone on the UCSC graph genome team. Uh, my advisor, David Hausler. Um, and the Global Alliance, which we've been working with uh, on this graph genome escapade. And also 1,000 Genomes for producing all this great uh, data that we use to build our graphs. Uh, are there any questions?